This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. First Part. Chapter 18. Four Thousand Leagues Under the Pacific. By the next morning, November 18th, I was fully recovered from my exhaustion of the day before, and I climbed onto the platform just as the Nautilus's chief officer was pronouncing his daily phrase. It then occurred to me that these words either referred to the state of the sea, or that they meant, there's nothing in sight. And in truth, the ocean was deserted, not a sail on the horizon. The tips of Crespo Island had disappeared during the night. The sea, absorbing every color of the prism except its blue rays, reflected the latter in every direction and sported a wonderful indigo tint. The undulating waves regularly took on the appearance of watered silk with wide stripes. I was marveling at this magnificent ocean view when Captain Nemo appeared. He didn't seem to notice my presence and began a series of astronomical observations. Then, his operations finished, he went and leaned his elbows on the beacon housing, his eyes straying over the surface of the ocean. Meanwhile, some twenty of the Nautilus's sailors, all energetic, well-built fellows, climbed onto the platform. They had come to pull up the nets left in our wake during the night. These seamen obviously belonged to different nationalities, although indications of European physical traits could be seen in all of them. If I'm not mistaken, I recognized some Irishmen, some Frenchmen, a few Slavs, and a native of either Greece or Crete. Even so, these men were frugal of speech, and used among themselves only that bizarre dialect whose origin I couldn't even guess, so I had to give up any notions of questioning them. The nets were hauled on board. They were a breed of trawl resembling those used off the Normandy coast, huge pouches held half open by a floating pole and a chain laced through the lower meshes. Trailing in this way from these iron glove makers, the resulting receptacles scoured the ocean floor and collected every marine exhibit in their path. That day they gathered up some unusual specimens from these fish-filled waterways. Angler fish whose comical movements qualify them for the epithet clowns, black commerson anglers equipped with their antennas, undulating triggerfish encircled by little red bands, bloated puffers whose venom is extremely insidious, some olive-fueled lampreys, snipe fish covered with silver scales, cutlass fish whose electrocuting power equals that of the electric eel and electric ray, scaly featherbacks with brown crosswise bands, greenish codfish, several varieties of goby, etc. Finally, some fish of larger proportions a one-meter jack with a prominent head, several fine bonito from the genus Scomber decked out in the colors of blue and silver, and three magnificent tuna whose high speeds couldn't save them from our trawl. I estimate that this cast of the net brought in more than 1,000 pounds of fish. It was a fine catch, but not surprising. In essence, these nets stayed in our wake for several hours, incarcerating an entire aquatic world in prisons made of thread so we were never lacking in provisions of the highest quality, which the Nautilus's speed and the allure of its electric lights would continually replenish. These various exhibits from the sea were immediately lowered down the hatch in the direction of the storage lockers, some to be eaten fresh, others to be preserved. After its fishing was finished and its air supply renewed, I thought the Nautilus would resume its underwater excursion, and I was getting ready to return to my stateroom when Captain Nemo turned to me and said without further preamble, look at this ocean professor doesn't it have the actual gift of life doesn't it experience both anger and affection last evening it went to sleep just as we did and there it is waking up after a peaceful night no hellos or good mornings for this gent you would have thought this eccentric individual was simply continuing a conversation we'd already started see he went on it's waking up under the sun's caresses it's going to relieve its daily existence what a fascinating field of study lies in watching the play of its organism. It owns a pulse and an arteries, it has spasms, and I side with the scholarly Commander Maury, who discovered that it has a circulation as real as the circulation of blood in animals. I'm sure that Captain Nemo expected no replies from me, and it seemed pointless to pitch in with, Ah, yes, exactly, or How right you are. Rather, he was simply talking to himself, with long pauses between sentences. He was meditating out loud. Yes, he said, the ocean owns a genuine circulation, 
and to start it going the creator of all things has only to increase its heat salt and microscopic animal life in essence he creates the different densities that lead to currents and countercurrents evaporation which is nil in the high arctic regions and very active in the equatorial zones brings about a constant interchange of tropical and polar waters what's more i've detected those falling and rising currents that make up the ocean's true breathing i've seen a molecule of salt water heat up at the surface sink into the depths reach maximum density at negative two degrees centigrade then cool off grow lighter and rise again at the poles you'll see the consequences of this phenomenon and through this law of far-seeing nature you'll understand why water can freeze only at the surface as the captain was finishing his sentence i said to myself the pole is this brazen individual claiming he'll take us even to that location meanwhile the captain fell silent and stared at the element he had studied so thoroughly and unceasingly then going on salts he said fill the sea in considerable quantities professor and if you removed all its dissolved saline content you'd create a mass measuring four million five hundred thousand cubic leads which if it were spread all over the globe would form a layer more than ten meters high and don't think that the presence of these salts is due merely to some whim of nature no they make ocean water less open to evaporation and prevent winds from carrying off excessive amounts of steam which when condensing would submerge the temperate zones salts play a leading role the role of stabilizer for the general ecology of the globe captain nemo stopped straightened up took a few steps along the platform and returned to me as for those billions of tiny animals he went on those infusoria that live by the millions in one droplet of water eight hundred thousand of which are needed to weigh one milligram their role is no less important they absorb the marine salts they assimilate the solid elements in the water and they create coral and madrepores they're the true builders of limestone continents and so after they finish depriving our water drop of its mineral nutrients the droplet gets lighter rises to the surface there absorbs more salts left behind through evaporation gets heavier sinks again and brings those tiny animals new elements to absorb the outcome a double current rising and falling constant movement constant life more intense than on land more abundant more infinite such life blooms in every part of this ocean an element fatal to man they say but vital to myriads of animals and to me when captain nemo spoke in this way he was transfigured and he filled me with the extraordinary excitement there he added out there lies true existence and i can imagine the founding of nautical towns clusters of underwater households that like the nautilus would return to the surface of the sea to breathe each morning free towns if ever there were independent cities then again who knows whether some tyrant captain nemo finished his sentence with a vehement gesture then addressing me directly as if to drive away an ugly thought professor Arnox, he asked me do you know the depth of the ocean floor at least captain i know what the major soundings tell us could you quote them to me so i could double check them as the need arises here i replied are a few of them that stick in my memory if i'm not mistaken an average depth of eight thousand two hundred meters was found in the north atlantic and two thousand five hundred meters in the mediterranean the most remarkable soundings were taken in the south atlantic near the thirty-fifth parallel and they gave twelve thousand meters fourteen thousand ninety one meters and fifteen thousand one hundred and forty nine meters all in all it's estimated that if the sea bottom were made level its average depth would be about seven kilometers well professor captain nemo replied we'll show you better than that i hope as for the average depth of this part of the pacific i'll inform you that it's a mere four thousand meters this said captain nemo headed to the hatch and disappeared down the ladder i followed him and went back to the main lounge the propeller was instantly set in motion and the log gave our speed as twenty miles per hour over the ensuing days and weeks captain nemo was very frugal with his visits i saw him only at rare intervals his chief officer regularly fixed the positions i found reported on the chart and in such a way i could exactly plot the nautilus's course conseil and land spent the long hours with me conseil had told his friend about the wonders of our undersea stroll and the canadian was sorry he hadn't gone along but i hoped an opportunity would arise for a visit to the forests of oceana almost every day the panels in the lounge were open for some hours and our eyes never tired of probing the mysteries of the underwater world the nautilus's general heading was southeast and it stayed at a depth between a hundred and a hundred and fifty meters 
However, from Lord knows what whim, one day it did a diagonal drive by means of its slanting fins, reaching strata located 2,000 meters underwater. The thermometer indicated a temperature of 4.25 degrees centigrade, which at this depth seemed to be a temperature common to all latitudes. On November 26, at 3 o'clock in the morning, the Nautilus cleared the Tropic of Cancer at longitude 172 degrees. On the 27th, it passed in sight of the Hawaiian Islands, where the famous Captain Cook met his death on February 14, 1779. By then, we had fared 4,860 leagues from our starting point. When I arrived on the platform that morning, I saw the island of Hawaii two miles to the leeward, the largest of the seven islands making up this group. I could clearly distinguish the tilled soil on its outskirts, the various mountain chains running parallel with its coastline, and its volcanoes, crowned by Mauna Kea, whose elevation is 5,000 meters above sea level. Among other specimens from these waterways, our nets brought up some peacock-tailed flabellarine coral, polyps flattened into stylish shapes and unique to this part of the ocean. The Nautilus kept to its southeasterly heading. On December 1st, it cut the equator at longitude 142 degrees, and on the 4th of the same month, after a quick crossing marked by no incident, we raised the Marquias Islands. Three miles off, in latitude 8 degrees 57 minutes south, and longitude 139 degrees 32 minutes west, I spotted Martin Point on Nuka Hiva, chief member of this island group that belongs to France. I could make out only its wooded mountains on the horizon, because Captain Nemo hated to hug shore. There our nets brought up some fine fish samples, dolphin fish with azure fins, gold tails, and flesh that's unrivaled in the entire world, wrasse from the genus Hologmonus that were nearly denuded of scales but exquisite in flavor, knife jaws with bony beaks, yellowish albacore that were as tasty as bonito, all fish worthy classifying in the ship's pantry. After leaving these delightful islands to the protection of the French flag, the Nautilus covered about 2,000 miles from December 4th to the 11th. Its navigating was marked by an encounter with an immense school of squid, unusual mollusks that are near neighbors of the cuttlefish. French fishermen gave them the name cuckoldfish, and they belonged to the class Cephalopoda, family Dibranchiata, consisting of themselves together with cuttlefish and argonauts. The naturalists of this antiquity made a special study of them, and these animals furnished many ribald figures of speech for soapbox orators in the Greek marketplaces, as well as excellent dishes for the tables of rich citizens, if we're to believe Athenus, a Greek physician predating Galen. It was during the night of December 9 through 10 that the Nautilus encountered this army of distinctly nocturnal mollusks. They numbered in the millions. They were migrating from the temperate zones toward zones still warmer, following the itineraries of herring and sardines. We stared at them through our thick glass windows. They swam backwards with tremendous speed, moving by means of their locomotive tubes, chasing fish and mollusks, eating the little ones, eaten by the big ones, and tossing in the indescribable confusion of the ten feet that nature has rooted in their heads like a hairpiece of nomadic snakes. Despite its speed, the Nautilus navigated for several hours in the midst of this school of animals, and its net brought up an incalculable number, among which I recognized all nine species that Professor Orbgeny has classified as native to the Pacific Ocean. During this crossing, the sea continually lavished us with the most marvelous sights. Its variety was infinite. It changed its settings and decor for the mere pleasure of our eyes, and we were called upon not simply to contemplate the works of our Creator in the midst of the liquid element, but also to probe the ocean's most daunting mysteries. During the day of December 11th, I was busy reading in the main lounge. Ned Land and Conseil were observing the luminous waters through the gaping panels. The Nautilus was motionless. Its ballast tanks full, it was sitting at a depth of 1,000 meters in a comparatively unpopulated region of the ocean, where only larger fish put in occasional appearances. Just then, I was studying a delightful book by Jean Massé, The Servants of the Stomach, and savoring its ingenious teachings, when Conseil interrupted my reading. Would Master kindly come here for an instant, he said to me in an odd voice. What is it, Conseil? It's something the Master should see. I stood up, went leaned on my elbows before the window, and I saw it. In broad electric daylight, an enormous black mass, quite motionless, hung suspended in the mist of the waters. I observed it carefully, trying to find out the nature of this gigantic cetacean. Then a sudden thought crossed my mind. 
"'A ship!' I exclaimed. "'Yes,' the Canadian replied, "'a disabled craft that's sinking straight down.' Ned Land was not mistaken. We were in the presence of a ship whose severed shroud still hung from their clasps. Its hull looked in good condition, and it must have gone under only a few hours before. The stumps of three masts chopped off two feet above the deck indicated a flooding ship that had been forced to sacrifice its masting. But it had healed sideways, filling completely, and it was listing to the port even yet. A sorry sight, this carcass lost under the waves, but sorrier still was the sight on its deck, where, lashed with ropes to prevent their being washed overboard, some human corpses still lay. I counted four of them, four men, one still standing at the helm, then a woman, halfway out of a skylight on the after-deck, holding a child in her arms. This woman was young. Under the brilliant lighting of the Nautilus's rays, I could make out her features, which the water hadn't yet decomposed. With a supreme effort, she had lifted her child above her head, and the poor little creature's arms were still twined around its mother's neck. The postures of the four seamen seemed ghastly to me, twisted from convulsive moments, as if making a last effort to break loose from the ropes that bound them to their ship. And the helmsman, standing alone, calmer, his face smooth and serious, his grizzled hair plastered to his brow, his hand clutching the wheel, seemed even yet to be guiding his wrecked three-master through the ocean depths. What a scene! We stood dumbstruck, hearts pounding, before the shipwreck caught in the act, as if it had already been photographed in its final moments, so to speak. And already I could see enormous sharks moving in, eyes ablaze, drawn by the lure of human flesh. Meanwhile, turning, the Nautilus made a circle around the sinking ship, and for an instant I could read the board on its stern. The Florida. Sunderland, England. End of chapter 18